Hey there everyone, this is the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage and I am making a video I've been contemplating for quite a long time and I finally came across uh, some good examples to show you here today and the question I want to to discuss is one that comes up many times and very often you see machines described as either industrial or domestic and today I'm going to show you uh, examples of what vintage sewing machines are in terms of domestic and or home grade versus industrial. I believe that it's pretty clear uh, what the difference is but there's a lot of discussion and confusion in both YouTube and eBay and places like this where you're going to see the term industrial tossed around a lot. Now I have a few theories as to why this happens. Uh, I think part of it is accidental and then part of it may be people who are, uh, they might be embellishing more than uh, they should be. And I wanted just to, to, clear, to clear up what should be um, uh, a pretty, pretty simple definition, but maybe it's not so simple after all. So what you're looking at, uh, I recently acquired yet another Black 301A. That's the Singer Slantomatic, magnificent machine. And uh, it is a black version of the first machine I ever restored. And I recall the day I opened it up and took it apart and I was in awe of its construction. I thought, wow, this thing is really powerful. And I was right. And I'm going to uh, show you that along with on the right, side of the table is the very first industrial sewing machine that I have ever purchased. Now I have tinkered on industrials before but in terms of buying my own and, I, and it's an overlock machine, it's a Mero uh, A-3DW or doorway water dash three uh, Mero overlock machine. And I'll talk more about it. I'll, make a, I'll be making a series of videos on this because all of you will enjoy watching me go through the process of doing something for the first time because uh, I know sometimes in my, in my videos I, I make it look simple because I've been restoring vintage domestic machines for quite a few years and I'm going to be coming up on a milestone. I'm not quite to 200 but I'm getting there and I, I expect this summer I will hit my 200th uh, domestic sewing machine restoration. So what I wanted to talk about today though was something I, you often see people describe vintage home sewing machines like the one on the right, uh, excuse me, the one on the left, the Singer 301, but it's not, it's not uh, exclusive to that model. Any vintage sewing machine that was used in the home, they're called either home sewing machines or domestic sewing machines. <clears throat> These machines of course are uh, the bulk of everything you see virtually everything on my channel and I've been restoring those for eight I think it's going on nine years now and sometimes when you go to look to purchase a machine this is particularly true on eBay where you will see machines advertised and sometimes they're called industrial which is not true and I'm referring to machines like the one on the left there any home sewing machine from the vintage era uh, sometimes they use the term industrial strength. Uh, they'll tell you, well, it's not industrial, but it's industrial strength. Uh, that is also not true. Um, sometimes they will say uh, industrial-like. <laughs> not true. So I want to kind of delve into some of the differences to explain why your machine, those these wonderful vintage heirloom quality home sewing machines that you all have, if you visited my channel, you've heard me go on and on about how incredible they are, and they are incredible. But everything should be appreciated in the context of what it was designed to do. Now, <clears throat> I chose both of these machines here. This, of course, the, the machine on the right is a overlock machine. Now, it doesn't actually look all that big and burly because it's not. The, the, uh, the Marrow machine that you see here has a fairly small footprint when you, look, when you stand it up next to the 301, and granted the 301 is not installed in a table, but still. Uh, most vintage sewing machines actually 
are much larger than that marrow and they can be as large or even much larger than my big big old blue steel toolbox that you see sitting on that sewing table. So uh, generally speaking, if you, if you can imagine the size of an outboard boat motor, that is what most <clears throat> or certainly many industrial sewing machines can be that big. They are much heavier than uh, domestic vintage sewing machines. Um, their tables, like the one you see here, are generally much heavier than the home sewing tables. And one of the biggest differences, of course, is in the sewing motor. And I'm going to zoom in here and we're going to go down and look. <clears throat> uh, in a later video, I'm going to go into the details of my new uh, acquisition here, my new uh, and first industrial sewing machine to call my own. Um, but I just briefly want to show you the motor mostly because I want to show it in contrast to a home sewing motor. And I don't have uh, my extra, I keep uh, extra um, home sewing motors, but they're in, they're in a different location where I've got some parts stored and I don't have it with me. And I was looking around the house to see what can I find that is similar to the size of an electric motor that many of us have on our vintage and even in the new uh, home sewing machines. And hopefully <clears throat> you will now understand why I had a jar of honey sitting on the table. I was looking in my uh, pantry and I found something uh, that approximates about the size of, a, uh, uh, of an electric motor that you would see, either, either an older motor or even the new replacements that you can get for your vintage sewing machine, <laughs> is about the size and shape of this jar of honey. So um, forgive me for using food to, uh, to talk about this, but I wanted to give you something to see in terms of the scale. Now look at the size of the jar in my hand and look at it next to this old clutch motor. This is a clutch motor from the 1940s. I forgot to mention my Marrow machine is, a, according to the Marrow company, which is still in business and provides support, it's a 1946 to 47 sewing machine. And I believe the clutch motor is from the same period. They look, they look like they were uh, joined together when they were new. But take a look, guys. Look how tiny it is. Now, the size of the motor housing itself is not the only thing that indicates uh, you know, the power of a sewing machine motor. But let me give you an example of uh, just comparing and contrasting the motors. Okay, guys, so here is a old Singer uh, electric motor. Take a look, it's 0.6 amps. And this is one of the earliest of the Singer motors. And this is attached to an early 1900s, maybe 1920 Singer 99. Now let's contrast what I just showed you with this. This is a one half horsepower. They come in different horsepower ratings. This motor is one half horsepower and is about anywhere from eight to 10 times uh, the power potential. It holds that much more potential than does the small home uh, sewing machine motor, the ones we're used to. This is a clutch style motor, and again, I'll go into more detail when I do a video on this machine specifically. The other thing to mention here is not just power, which everyone seems to focus on, but also speed. This machine is, oh, this machine, this motor is rated at 1725 RPMs or revolutions per minute. And that is much faster than the little home sewing motors that, that are attached to our vintage home sewing machines. Some of these clutch motors, of course, uh, you could spec them out. You could order them where they would, uh, they would hit 3,500 RPMs. And that's really moving uh, super fast. So in showing you this, I wanted to kind of illustrate the tremendous difference in not only the power and the speed of an industrial sewing machine, uh, but also the purpose because that's not to make any of us or any of you feel like, gosh, there's something wrong with my home vintage sewing machine. It's not powerful enough. And that's not true. You've heard me go uh, on and on about how impressive the um, domestic or vintage 
home sewing machines are, and they are incredibly powerful. In fact, most of the machines we use from the vintage era for home sewing are a lot more powerful than we ever even need. We don't always tap the full potential because we don't even need it. That's how well they were constructed uh, and what they were essentially designed to do. Now, there are other vintage models beside the 301 here that can sew even heavier materials and have even stronger motors. But the, the main thing I wanted to talk to you today was why do you think people call home sewing machines, like the one on the left here, industrial or industrial strength when they are not? So I'll give you an example. Uh, my first machine, which you see illustrated, if you go to my, my channel homepage, you will see a two-tone cream and beige Singer 301. It's the very first machine I ever restored. And uh, that machine, I'll never forget. I, I got it home and I, I had it sitting for a while and said, okay, uh, you know, here goes nothing. I've got, to, I've got to start investigating this and see what it's like. And uh, I opened up the top of the machine. So one of the first things that I did was I took, I saw these access screws, there were screws on top, I loosened them, and then I saw holes at the very top. And remember, at first I wasn't sure what this was, it just said Singer, and I knew that Singer had made industrial sewing machines. I thought, oh, it's got holes for oiling, you don't see that on new machines. And of course it has screws, you know, so it's designed to be serviced, obviously. So then, of course, I took off the lid. And when I saw what was underneath, and I'll show you if I can get out of my own shadow here and let you see. Imagine seeing this for the first time. You see those steel gears. You don't see any plastic. And I first saw this and thought, wow, maybe this was used in a factory someplace. That was a very naive a uh, question that I had simply because I had never seen anything like this and I wasn't really totally sure what I was looking at but I was pretty darned impressed with the fact that I'm looking at all steel. It, it almost looked like someone had uh, taken the the co valve covers off of a car engine and I was looking down into uh, into the metal parts of an engine. And then of course at some point I went and I uh, loosened this set screw which holds the little drain pan that many of you if you've if you've ever looked underneath your Singer 301 or your 400 500 series they have these these drip pans and this one is uh, as you can tell I haven't restored it yet it's it looks like it has the original felt and the old oil and dust bunnies but all of that will come off when I restore it so take a look at the underside some of you may have never seen the underside of a of a, of a sewing machine and of course if you see a Singer 201 you will see large gear sets as well. Let's get it to focus in. I want you folks to see. Let's try to imagine why would people call this industrial. Remember all of us have grown up with basically plastic junk uh, that's been sold to us as things we might use around our house. Okay now this one here let's, let's see if I can turn it for you and zoom in. I don't know if that's going to help or not. Let's try this. I think I'll just use the natural light here and get rid of that light shining on it. But look at this. You can imagine why someone might look at that and think, God, that had to have been used in a factory. Look at all that steel. I mean, it is just a, quote, sewing machine, unquote, right? And this is, this is what I think happens when people see if we can find the other there's another gear where are you oh, i'm thinking about a different machine model but you can just imagine when someone sees this surely this is not something that would have been used for the home i mean you look at it you see all the steel and it requires grease and lubrication and you know then come over here and look at if i can not zoom in so close Let's take a look at the marrow, right? Look at all the metal that you don't see any plastic on it either. And this particular machine, this marrow doesn't look very large, but of course it has that giant motor underneath. So you can understand why someone might even think that uh, this old home sewing machine, the 301, was used in a factory, but of course it never was. And that's something that really surprises people when they, 
when they see this. In fact, I remember showing this to a group of people once and I remember taking the top lid off and taking a flashlight and pointing in there and everyone looked and their jaws dropped because they couldn't believe they had never seen a consumer grade product that was made with this level of quality and I call them heirloom quality for a reason because they're designed to last, to be maintained, obviously. One day I was in a thrift store and I found an old iron. And when I say old, I don't mean like 70s or 60s. I mean really old. This is an old hot point electric iron. And you get it far enough away so you guys can see. Look at the heavy duty uh, steel spring uh, flex cord and actually it swivels. It has a control uh, knob on the front. And that control knob, I don't know if you can see this, it has a little access screw. So like so many things, it was designed to be serviced. It's very heavy. It has a like a Bakelite handle. But again, you know, this type of construction of, of just, these are just home appliances. You know, this would have been something you get in the houseware section. And I believe this is why people today often call home sewing machines from the vintage era like this one but any of them really industrial because a lot of people assume they are i mean you know they've never seen home products you know if you get a new laundry iron today they have some really cool features in the new irons but they weigh less they were largely plastic and most of them are not designed to last i seriously this one is from the 20s i'm gonna say it's probably 90 years old and it still works. I can't imagine any of the new irons you buy today uh, working 90 years, 80 years from now. So anyway, I wanted you to see this and, and make a point. Did you notice, if you, if you remember, I was showing that the little, uh, many of the vintage machines, at least until we get to the late 60s, early 70s, they have oiling uh, little holes for you to in, uh, install oil in. And that's important because when you're sewing on home projects, here you'll see, there we go, you'll see the oiling holes where you add a drop of oil. Now some industrial sewing machines had that, uh, particularly those that might have been used in a tailor shop, but the majority of industrial sewing machines had actual oil pans. They had oil reservoirs where you would add oil and you would have to keep a check on the oil level. This is a little indicator on the old marrow here um, where you could check your oil level. Because think about it, if you were in a factory and you're sewing away for hours and shifts at a time, having to add a drop of oil every 10 minutes would hurt your productivity. So again, I'll, I'll talk more about this when I do the video on whether you need an industrial sewing machine or not. This is one of the things that will kind of give it away when you're trying to say, hey, is that industrial or home? That's just another uh, feature that, that distinguishes in du true industrial sewing machines from the home sewing machines. And the last thing I want to kind of mention here is I want to be sure I want to be sure to emphasize to you that when I talk about the fact that home sewing machines from the vintage era are not industrial, they're not industrial strength. They are unbelievably strong compared to the new plastic sewing machines today. So let's figure out what should we call them. They're not like industrials, they're really not. They were built, well these two machines were built just a few years apart, but uh, they're very different. But what I like to tell people when they ask me this, I say that vintage sewing machines for what I call heirloom quality, meaning you, they can be used generation after generation if they're cared for, they really are heavy duty, all metal, vintage home sewing machines. And the word heavy duty, is, is that even that's a little, you know, in, uh, nebulous. I mean, what does that mean? I call them strong, old school, all metal sewing machines. And that's what they are. And they kick butt. They can out sew most of the new sewing machines. You can get new sewing machines that the new, um, some of the new sewing machines have, they have some great features and some of them are quite expensive. Some of them can sew some of the heavier materials that you might have sewn with the old machines, 
but, but I don't believe that they are necessarily going to last as long. They have LCD screens, they have software. And, and here the point is not to, to bash those machines. In fact, many of my customers have new sewing machines, but they want one or two or more vintage machines in their sewing rooms because there are times when they need the power and the quality of a vintage machine that they just can't get in a new one that is designed for the home. So again, folks, um, if you see anyone taking materials, and I'll, I'll show, here's a man's belt, for example, leather belt. It has a very stiff leather, okay? And you will sometimes see people put these under vintage home sewing machines, and they'll show off how powerful they are. Now, you all have seen me demonstrate sewing of uh, garment weight leather, which is soft, and I have even tried to sew some leather that was used for a book cover but that's an extreme example. But look at this. If you take three layers of this man's stiff leather belt and you try to, first of all, you, you may not even get it under the foot of a home sewing machine, but even if you can, you will see people do videos where they demonstrate how powerful their machines are. And you can do this with garment weight leather, multiple layers. You can do this with heavy fabrics. You've seen me do that in some of my videos. But once you get into stiff leathers like this, if you do take a home vintage sewing machine and you try to do this, you can sometimes force them through, but it's not good. You're gonna cause the motors to burn up or you're going to uh, possibly damage the drive shaft and certainly break needles. And that would be a shame because when I call these wonderful all metal home sewing machines um, heirloom quality, I mean it, they can last who knows how long they'll keep lasting if you take care of them and use them. You can use them for much heavier projects than a lot of the new plastic machines, but everything should be used the way it was designed. And the home sewing machines were not designed to be used in a factory. They were not designed for this kind of heavy, heavy duty work or extreme work. In fact, um, most industrial sewing machines will not actually sew stiff leathers either. Uh, and I'll, like I say, I'll be doing another video on industrial machines. But I'm very curious to hear what you all think of the term industrial and uh, what you've come across in the past. But anyway, I just wanted to highlight this. It's something I've been thinking about for a while now. Please uh, feel free to subscribe to my channel. If you do, you can click on the little bell symbol and it will notify you when I have a new video up. But uh, I've been contemplating this for some time and now that I have, I have many domestic home sewing machines that are waiting my restoration and now uh, an industrial that I'm gonna tackle hopefully this summer. But thank you guys for watching. This is something that I really, really feel strongly about. Never overuse or abuse a vintage home sewing machine and treat it like an industrial because it's not. Having said that, they are awesome and amazing, and they're what I use to sew most of my projects with. Thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you soon.